In today's bonus episode, I'm headed back to first grade, and I'm taking you with me. I'm going to tell you a story about a little boy named Marshawn, who all those years ago, unbeknownst to him, informed the way that I approach summer, the way that I approach the transition from school year to summertime with my boys, and the way that I approach even sometimes our daily activities. What I learned from him way back when, stick around, it might be helpful for you. Enjoy today's show. We grew up with the phrase, home is where the heart is, but our culture has shifted and now the message is, home should be Pinterest perfect. I'm calling BS on that message. Home, it's not about the stuff, it's about the story. And whether you know it or not, your home is a reflection of you and is already saying something. So what is it that you want it to say? Hey, I'm Danny, a former first grade teacher turned home decorator. Going from a dual income to a single income so I could stay home with my babies meant budget, like ramen eating, Goodwill shopping budget, and I learned a few things along the way, like how to bring big style to your home without breaking the bank, and I'm sharing it all with you. Tips, tricks, decor, and design advice so you can learn to tell your story with your style, where you can start living free from the Pinterest perfect trap and start living a life of intention. Welcome to Fig and Farm at Home where we design happy living and where it doesn't have to be perfect to be beautiful. Several years ago, when I was teaching first grade in Iowa, I had a little boy in my classroom named Marshawn. Of course, Marshawn is not his real name. It's a pseudonym. But Marshawn was a sweet little boy. He was as sweet as he was cute. He had a vibrant smile. He came into the classroom with this wonderful energy. He got along well with his classmates. He listened well to direction and redirection when he needed to. He overcame learning challenges and was just really excelling. Marshawn was delightful to have in class. Monday through Thursday. (laughs) Fridays rolled around and a different Marshawn walked through my door. Marshawn on Fridays was cranky. He was defiant. He did not get along well with his with his classmates. He didn't want to listen to what I had to say. He got angry at direction and redirection. And if you can imagine, he needed a lot of redirection on Fridays. <laughs> Marshawn was a different little boy. And it took about five weeks for me to start picking up on this pattern that Monday through Thursday, Marshawn was sweet and compliant. And on Fridays, he was not. I had my suspicions about what was going on. I chatted with the school counselor and the principal, and I informed instruction for Marshawn on Fridays to help him in the way that I thought he should. I'll reveal what it was in a little bit. A couple weeks went by, a couple more weeks, and we were now approaching Thanksgiving break, our first substantial break over the course of the school calendar. I needed a break. The kids needed a break. If you were to be in my first grade classroom at the time, you would have seen lots of hands-on learning, lots of creativity, lots of learning that took place in a fun in a fun way. That particular week, we were having a Friendsgiving. We made our own food and we served it and we dressed up and we had all of the history that was going into the lesson. And that week was hell with Marshawn. That week was the worst week yet. And it was from the start to the end, I earned my paycheck. He was defiant. He was rude. He was belligerent. He was unkind to his classmates. He was all the things. I desperately needed a break. And when I left that day, packed up my classroom, locked the door, left, I needed a break. And I enjoyed that break. And as much as relaxing as I was doing, Marshawn was going to work. Marshawn in his six-year-old self, was trying to make sense of his little world outside of the structured environment that I had created for him. It was work for him. Marshawn, though he came from a really lovely family and had lots of wonderful support, brothers and sisters who cared for him, mom and dad who cared for him, Marshawn was entering into an environment where he didn't know what to expect in the morning, what to expect in the evening. He didn't know what rhythms and structures and systems were put into place in order to make his day go smoothly. And that lack of structure for him was debilitating. And that lack of structure led to all of those Friday disturbances and all of those uh, days leading up to break disturbances. It made my job harder, but it was his angst that was acting out. It was his angst of the unknown coming out. 
So in my classroom environment, though all those creative things I just shared happened, what you would expect on a database basis was really structure in action for Marshawn and all the other students. And what we know historically, and this is generally speaking, most children thrive with boundaries and structure. They thrive when they know what the expectations are. And of course, every kiddo is different. You'll see different kiddos on different levels of the continuum of that. But generally speaking, most kiddos thrive with some semblance of structure. So walking into my classroom, you would have already been greeted with something to do at your desk. It's already laid out. There you go. We would have worked on that for about 10 minutes, and then we would have had morning meeting. In morning meeting, if anything was changing throughout the day, we would have talked about it then. Then we would have headed right into reading groups for an hour, and then math, and then recess, and then it's all laid out. Not only is it laid out, and it's the same every day, it is written and laid out on the board with pictorial representation if kiddos aren't quite reading yet, with words for those who are, with time frames for those who need that. It's all laid out. So imagine going from all of that structure then to not knowing what time you're going to go to bed and who's coming over and going to be actually taking your bed to what you're going to be eating and when you're going to be eating and who you're going to be playing with and what's going to be happening and who's coming over and where are you going. All of that caused a disturbance for Marshawn that led to all of the the Friday behavior, all of the week leading up to summer, or you know, not summertime, uh, Thanksgiving behavior. I learned a lot from Marshawn that year. Fast forward a few years, and now I am at home with my own babies, and we are starting school. And we are now well into school routines, and we have several of the kiddos in school. And What I have noticed is that each transition period for us, not necessarily Fridays, but definitely winter break and summer break, the first few days within those breaks are hell. (laughs) They, I am working extremely hard. I am getting angry at the children. I am super frustrated. And honestly, if I'm being quite honest, resentful, resentful that now that we're on this break and we're I have all these fun things planned and isn't this great? And you're being a stinker. You're being a stinker. Your behavior is being a stinker and resentful because gosh darn it, I could, I could have a job somewhere instead of being here with you. Isn't that the worst thing to think? Okay. I'm just laying it all out there. That's a mindset that I have in those dark moments. And a couple years went by into this routine thinking, this is really, really hard. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks. Marshawn flooded into my memory and it was an aha moment. And I am so thankful that it happened early enough on that I was able to change the the trajectory of how we approached the transition from school year into summer and even the school year into Christmas break, extended breaks. Here's what happens. Here's what we do. So I know that out of my three kiddos, we are on that same continuum of some of us need a whole lot of structure and some of us don't. Some of us can go with the flow and be happy with whatever comes, but some of us need to know to the minute what to expect all the time. And it can be anxiety producing when that isn't provided. So understanding that about your kiddo, understanding that about my kiddo was essential. But in this case, not all cases, in this case, we all approached it together. We weren't singling anyone out and we were all in this together. So the first four days of summer break, we would play school. (laughs) And it was a lot of work on my end. It was a lot of work to set up what I'm about to tell you. But we would have timeline for five classes. And those five classes were generally PE, reading, science, art, and math. And we would have a timeline. We would know that maybe 45 minutes for each one. We knew what time we were starting. We would take a little break in between. Sometimes we would have a recess maybe after two subjects. Recess, of course, looked like just going outside and playing, but I would call them in at the 10 minute mark and then we'd get back to it. So for PE, we would go out and we'd play Foursquare or maybe a game of soccer. We would do something, maybe go up to the park and play basketball. For art, maybe I got out the Play-Doh. Maybe we actually did a painting project, something creative. For science, we did a small science experiment. A lot of times it was something with a garden. Sometimes it was science in the kitchen. For math, I would buy the math workbooks for the kiddos from Costco, and they each did their own age level 
learning level appropriate math page. And then for reading, (laughs) because I'm a book nerd and I have all the books from my days of teaching, we would start with a couple, a couple picture books and then they would read independently. And at lunchtime, of course, we had hot lunch, hot lunch, (laughs) joined the fanfare too. And I had thrifted three vintage school trays. So vintage meaning I think they were from the 60s. They were, and I still have them. They are the colors orange, avocado green, that dusty, yucky mustard yellow, those ones, you know, from the 60s, your your mom's probably had the blender, the fridge, the appliances of those colors. Think that trio, and I have them in my kitchen tray, <laughs> the school lunch tray. And I would set up lunch. It was a hot lunch, so maybe macaroni and cheese or soup, and then they had a choice of a couple veggies, a choice of a couple fruits, and then a dessert and a drink, special drink very much like school. They And they loved that. They loved that. Now, as the days went on, the first day was very structured. The first day we did, we did it to the letter and we did the 45 minute and we did the, you know, the cowbell to, for recess and all of that. As those four days moved on, we could eliminate one lesson or we could eliminate one time block. We could eliminate just a little bit of that rigidity, that structure. And by the end of those four days, we were seamlessly flowing into summer. We were able to transition super smoothly into what summer looked like for us. Now, as the kids are older, we don't necessarily need to do that anymore, but it's become tradition. So now traditions are fun and fun is meant to be had. So (laughs) we sometimes do that just for a day. And if not that, we sometimes just do an art thing together. And then of course, I will bust out the vintage school trays, and we'll have that on the first day of summer break. It's just now tradition. But those days of transitioning from the structure of school to summer were so essential. I'm not saying that days were perfect or there was no misbehavior at all, but comparatively, if you were to be a fly on the wall to those early days to, we'll say, even three years ago, oh my goodness, it was a dramatic difference. And it was a game changer. And I am so thankful to have figured out that little nugget that Marshawn taught me all those years ago. So keep that in the back of your mind. I know that right now, our summer is officially starting on Wednesday, the 23rd of June. And that's really late in our nation. A lot of you have are well on your way, but tuck that away. Tuck that away in case you're wondering why it always seems like your little one, your sweet little angel is always acting up the first couple days of summer. Maybe they just need a little bit more structure. I want to talk to you too about the idea of creating a little bit of framework for your days in the summertime and how sometimes creating that framework can be beneficial for for those kiddos who just need a little bit of structure. Now, I love to play with my kids during the summer. I've always been working in some capacity, but it's creative work. And it it has always been, I work when I have time or I have flexibility or it's nap time. Greg is home. I've always worked in that way. This summer is going to be different. This summer, I am going to need to have dedicated time to really focus on my business. I'm going to need that space. And thankfully, because I've laid out this framework in years past, it should flow seamlessly into plan for for this summer as well. So here's what we do. When the kiddos were little, they did need more structure. They just did. But as they're getting older, of course, they can inform their own timelines. They can, they just need the framework to fall into place. Two of the goals I have for creating this framework for my kiddos in summertime, actually three. One is so that I can get some things accomplished so that I am not relied on to be their entertainment, because that's just exhausting. (laughs) Another goal I have for creating this framework for them is so that they are not stuck on their screens all day long. And then the third one, the third goal I have for creating this framework is because I want to avoid the phrase, I'm bored. I'm bored. I don't have anything to do. I'm bored. Now in our home, they will often hear, the kids will often hear, boredom is a choice. Boredom is a choice, just like going and playing Legos is a choice. Boredom is a choice, just like going outside is a choice. Boredom is a choice, just like playing board games is a choice. Boredom is a choice that you choose. When we provided all kinds of things for the kiddos to do, indoor activities, outdoor activities, you know, if you walk into their room, you might trip over a toy. That tells me they have things to do. (laughs) 
<laughs> so boredom is a choice. What I found too, before I go into the framework, what I found too is that when we take away some of those screen time options, more creative play happens. Like recently, it was a non-screen time day. We do have days in our home that are screen time days and non-screen time days. And it was a non-screen time day. And my two little ones have collected G.I. Joe toys. And they've inherited some of the ones that were Greg's from when he was little. And they love playing with their G.I. Joes. And dramatic play happens. I love dramatic play. It is so much fun. And it really reminds me of when we were little. But they created their own video game. <laughs> with their G.I. Joes. In fact, I'll, I'll post the video of it on in the show notes for this because it is just the most adorable little thing. We had a, a fighter plane suspended over the rail, so it's hanging down the stairs. We have all kinds of strings attached to men who were being manipulated by the video game operator. We had the video game announcer we had we had one guy operate the strings to move the airplane. My words just will not do it justice. I will post it in the show notes and do take a peek because it's the most adorable little thing. And this is something that is a product of not giving in to screen time, quite honestly. Not relying on screen time as being the babysitter or the end-all be-all. We want our kids to stretch their minds in, in different ways, and this is an example of that. Okay, so the framework that I use and I've used for a long time is really actually taking shape this summer. I'll report back actually to how it's going to go. But if you were in the teaching world, you might, or you even have heard your kiddo, your young kiddo say, oh, mom, we had daily five today in class. Without going into the details, daily five is generally a reading thing. You focus on five different skills within that language arts reading realm every day. That's why it's called the daily five. So it might be reading, writing, um, word work, that kind of thing. But we're taking that principle and we are applying it to summer times. Now, the littler they are, of course, the more prep it is for mom, right? The older they are, it's now just a suggestion. So let me give you an idea what our, our daily five are and what they have been. And I'll give you some examples of some of the categories within each one. So our daily five, and this is for us this summer, they are going to do each of the five things each day, which will allow me to have five hours of uninterrupted work time. Do I need five hours every day? I don't think so, but it allows me that space and that time to have it if I need it. What I'm hoping for is that I will be able to work four hours a day and call that good, and then work a little bit here and there. Because Ultimately, I do want to play with my kiddos, but my daily five is going to be set up so that I can have that space and that time so that I won't necessarily just see them plugged in or asking for screen time all day long because that drives me crazy. And it gives them just that framework to fill in. So here they are, something creative, something where they are learning, something where they are outdoors, something where they are with their brothers or with their friends and something independent. So right now, because they are older, they are going to choose something creative and do it for an hour. They're going to choose something where they're learning and do it for an hour. Something outdoors, do it for an hour. That gives me five hours. Let me give you an example of the creative. So they can do Legos, which by the way, they could do literally five hours a day. <laughs> they could do Legos. They could play G.I. Joe's. They could write, they like to make comic books. They could do that. They could make still motion movies with my phone and the Legos. They could draw. They could do, we have a couple coding programs they could do. They like to create their own games. So they could create their own games. Something learning. My kids are voracious readers. They all like to read. So I imagine it's going to fall into that category easily. They could get on National Geographic and look at some of their kids' programs on National Geographic. They can do some coding. They can puzzle books, and we have uh, crossword puzzles, Sudoku. They can do those kinds of things. That all falls into that category of learning. When they go outdoors, they can play soccer. They can play at the park. They can ride the bike. They can shoot hoops. They can set up the slip and slide. They can play volleyball. They can even work out in the garage if they wanted to. If they wanted to go running, if they wanted to work on the elliptical, it's up to them. Something with their brothers or with their friends. If it's within the neighborhood, they're able to go and hang out with the kiddos within their neighborhood and just checking in with me to tell me what they're doing and where they're going to be. Uh, sometimes they like to play board games together, neighborhood play, what, whatever it is that they're choosing to be with their friends or with their brothers. And then the independent hour. And I think that's really critical because not all of my children are 
are extroverts. And I think they do need a little bit of time to recharge and regroup, even if they are extroverts. Okay, so how does that look if you have a 14-year-old, right? I have a 14-year-old, I have a 12-year-old, and I have a 10-year-old. And basically, I'm not, I'm not going to dictate what they're doing. I, we're beyond that. They are old enough to be able to choose what they're doing. I don't care what they're doing as long as they are being kind to each other. They are staying safe and they're giving me space to work. So I don't really care if they are drawing versus Legos or if they are making a still motion movie, if they're doing it independently or together. I, that doesn't bother me. I don't, I don't mind. It'll be fun to see what they choose. And I can't wait to see what they choose because they are always so creative, but I don't have to micromanage that. Now, when they were little, when they were four, six, and eight, I would have things set out for them and choices to be made. I might even have a schedule. I might even have like Monday, these are your creative choices. Tuesday, these are your creative choices. Wednesday, these are your creative choices and give them like a menu that they could choose from. It's not necessarily needed now because my children are a lot older, but when they were little, it's an unrealistic expectation to think that your kiddo is going to be able to fill five hours, if that's what you needed, we'll say, of time coming up with things on their own to do. <laughs> so providing a menu within that framework is a good thing. So here's an example of some of the menu items I would provide for each of my categories that I just laid out for you. Something creative, something learning, something outdoors, something with your brothers or with your friends, and something independent. So if they were little, let's say they were in their four, six, eight-year-old stages, a menu item I would have provided for being creative might be Play-Doh, kinetic sand, watercolors, chalk, coloring, doing an art kit, a menu item I might have created for their learning might have been using their workbook, doing a science experiment, playing with their steam toys or doing a steam project, setting out different books that they could read independently. Something for outdoors would honestly look a lot like the ones I just laid out for you. Soccer, playing at the park, bike riding, playing volleyball, doing slip and slide, playing in their backyard, those kinds of things. Now, when they're little, of course, they need to be monitored a little bit more. If I had something to do, we might just say, okay, these activities are happening in the backyard. You need to stay in the backyard so that I can get whatever it was I was working on done. But it also could look like me modifying whatever it was I was working on in order to go out, you know, set up a chair and let them do their outdoor activity while I was still working on whatever it was I was working on. The framework and the structures that I'm setting up, they're intentional. They're intentional so that I don't become the entertainment, so that they don't focus on me for absolutely every minute of their summertime. Can I provide ideas? Absolutely. Do I want to provide ideas every day? No, I don't. <laughs> that is why the framework is here, so that these ideas are already thought of and they know that they can freely choose within the confines of that framework. I'll give you an update. Maybe a month in, I'll give you an update about how it is that this framework is working and what our five categories are looking like and some of the successes we've had within that. I hope this is helpful for you if you are finding yourself scratching your head and pulling out your hair thinking, I just need to get some work done. And even if it's not like work on my business, but I just, I want to like mop the floor. <laughs> <laughs> or my kids are telling me all the time that they're so bored, or I'm tired of looking at them, looking at their screens. Whatever it is for you, if you need just a little bit more of a framework, use that. I hope that's helpful. And the next time Christmas break rolls around, or next summer when next summer rolls around, and you are wondering why your kiddo went from sweet angel to a little bit more defiant, ask yourself if they thrive on structure. And if they thrive on structure, chances are you might need to transition them in a way that would make summertime a success. If you have any questions, of course, reach out, pop into my DMs at Fig and Farm on Instagram or on Facebook and ask away. I'm an open book. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that bonus episode and I'll see you real soon. Hey, real quick before you go, if you learned something new or found value in today's podcast, would you head over to iTunes to Fig and Farm at Home and leave a review and subscribe to the show? That would be awesome. And if you'd like to connect with my community of mamas who are learning to be intentional storytellers within their own homes, join us at bit.ly forward slash design 101 group. There's always more room at the table. See you soon.